to the time of opening the, the gathering yesterday and uh, Shane turned up in a waistcoat and a cravat or a, a, a necktie, neck, neck chief, and I just looked at myself Well, I said, I'm going to be behind the camera, I'm not in front of the camera at any point. And then I realised I forgot to get somebody to introduce Taffy. Um, so that, worked, that didn't work. I, I hope I don't need to introduce Taffy other than saying Taffy is our wonderful of our patrons of the Society of Historic. Wendy's there, you should be doing that. I didn't see you there. Um, okay. Uh, Taffy is, is a steadfast supporter of the Society of Storytelling, and uh, it seemed natural following the AGM to ask him to give us a, uh, an address on storytelling post pandemic and inspire us to keep going forward and to take the energy that's building up in the SFS at the moment and really run with it. So, ladies and gentlemen, ta oops, I'm sorry, I'm Taffy Thomas! Somebody pointed out to me in the cafe all the years they've seen me, it's the first time they've ever seen me look nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and I said, well, the day that I'm not nervous before doing something new, Storytelling, I should stop doing it. It means I don't care. So, this is because you see, when in, I was lucky enough to be at the Marrakesh International Storytelling Festival, and Amster met me by a pond in a Riyadh. How is that for a spell? <laughs> and said, I'd like you to deliver a 30 minute inspirational speech after the AGM. And I thought, what to do. But then, as ever, Chrissy, my muse, and I relied on the god who looks after storytellers and drugs. <laughs> <laughs> and we have that cover between us, folks. <clears throat> anyway, somebody came up to me and said, Taffy, you and Chrissy, you're in your mid 70s and you haven't retired, you're still doing it, even though. You're in your golden years. Nice. And I thought, golden years. It was a spark. And it was a spark of Chrissy. And it reminded me of a line from Tolkien in The Hobbit. So a quote from Tolkien will be my starting point here. If folk valued food, company, and stories more than hoarded gold, the world will be a merrier place. <laughs> so we go from there, you see, because all that glitters is not gold. Um, and I like to think that as storytellers, we have access through the stories to three E's entertainment. Education and enlightenment. Mm. Mm. It's the stories that do those. But you can't do the education and enlightenment bit unless you have the entertainment. <coughs> That's what we need. It's the entertainment. We're entertainers. Because storytelling preserves the past, reveals the present, and creates the future. Mm. So it's within the stories to do that. Because when I say all the glitters is not gold, I was in a school in Liverpool not so long ago, and you never do a performance in school in Liverpool, but you come away with a store. It's, it is the national capital of patter, <laughs> and it's wonderful. Uh, and a little lad came up to me and said, Taffy, are you rich? <laughs> said, yes, but not in the way you mean. He said, what do you mean? I said, well, I know over 300 stories, and I get to meet lovely people like you. But some days, my pockets are empty. And he looked at me and nodded and said, I get what you mean. <laughs> oh. And I thought, that was a precious moment. So all the good is 
is within the stories we can find values of honesty, compassion, and love. And those are values more precious than gold. So I'll tell you a story. There was a hill, on top of the hill was the king's palace. But the end turret of the Paris palace was the exchequer. But the flag above the exchequer was at half mast. Because the man who lived there, who looked after the king's wealth, all of his gold, had died. And even though he'd known he was time limited, life limited, he hadn't passed on his knowledge and his skills to somebody younger to keep it going after he passed. And that really is a moral for all of us. Because the key to all of this is to pass it on. And through passing on, we keep people alive who are no longer lost. A lot of people who gave us stories who are no longer here in that form, keeping them alive in their story. Duncan Williamson once said to me, if you tell somebody a story, you never die. You live on in that story. So the exchequer had died. The king had a problem. He needed somebody to take on that job and look after his extensive finances. So he asked the wise man in his court how he could find somebody who was honest enough to be his exchequer. And the wise man said, we've got to find a wise man. And this time in this country, where well, it was as difficult then as it would be now. <laughs> <laughs> and then he said, no, I have a plan. Tomorrow, I want you to come to the long room and sit in your, on your throne at the end of the long room. Sit on your throne. Which you could have passed Alistair the crown here. <laughs> <laughs> we haven't brought it. Anyway, king himself does. And he said, and next to you, I want your court musician. <laughs> Anybody who wants the job of exchequer has to come in for an interview. And the wise man stood next to the musician with a harp. At the end of the long room by the door, he placed a bag of gold coins. The first person to come in who fancied the job was a man with a salt and pepper coloured beard. <laughs> and he walked up to the wise man, he said, I've come for the job of exchequer. And the wise man said, this is going to be a very unusual interview, because I need you to dance. <laughs> and the man with the salt and pepper beard he just refused point blank. <laughs> he didn't normally dance, and when he did, he didn't dance normally. <laughs> if you have that line, watch the singing as well. All right, my gift to you that line. All right, he refused. So the wise man said, you haven't got the job. The man with the salt and pepper beard walked away. And then the next person to come in was a man, and I can't see one, with a red beard. No, not one red beard. Yeah. <laughs> Get the henna to Alistair. Cook. Yeah. <laughs> man with a red beard. He walked in, and uh, the wise man said, "This is an unusual interview. I need you not to talk about how good you are with mathematics, but I need you to dance for the king." And the man with the red beard, he refused. <laughs> 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 Not doing it. In that case, the wise man said, The job 
is not yours. You've gone. So the man with the red beard and the man with the salt and pepper beard, they cleared off out of the castle, down the road to the pub, yeah. <laughs> which is exactly what you would expect. <laughs> and the king looked worried, but there was one man still at the door who came in, a man with a long white beard. <laughs> he came in and he stood next to the wise man and the musician. <laughs> and uh, and the wise man said, you've come for the job of exchequer? He said, I have. He said, well, it's an unusual interview. I need you to dance for the king. And the wise man said, the job is yours. Oh. He said, well, please explain. And the wise man said, well, at the entrance to the long room, I put a bag of gold coins and salt and pepper and red beards. They couldn't resist dipping their hand in that bag as they came in. <laughs> and they knew that if they danced, you would hear the sound of it. So they refuse, which is why they haven't got the job. And but Whitebeard, he was able to resist the bag of gold. Uh, surprisingly, <laughs> so he was happy to dance for you, which is why the job is his. So Whitebeard made his way to the Exchequer Tower. And started work. Whereas Salt Pepper Beard and Red Beard down the road in the bar chatting to each other remembered that if they valued company, food, and stories more than hoarded gold, then the job of Exchequer might have been theirs. <laughs> Let's all together with a story if we can, always. Anyway, uh, so gold is the theme running through this. And of course, the gold that we most value is that of bright Phoebus, the sun. And it was bright Phoebus, the sun, that took us to Marrakesh in February. Several of us who were here for a truly wonderful couple of weeks. And of course, since then, we discovered Marrakesh and the Atlas Mountains have had a terrible time with the earthquakes. So we're heading in that direction now. But, but the festival was so successful in the Medina, in Marrakesh, that the corner building in the square, and I'm hoping it's still standing there, they're planning that the roof of it is going to be a roof garden for storytelling <coughs> yeah. for the future. So there's not just going to be Snake charmers and monkeys. And the guy <laughs> on the roof is going to be a storyteller. Mm -hmm. And a young student who was Christian my guide for the week, a young man called Omar, who lived with his family in the Atlas Mountains. <laughs> Every morning he had to walk for an hour, and then he had a two hour bus ride to get into the city to come to our Rio for nine in the morning wow. to take us to our gigs. And he did it. So I said to my festival <coughs> organizer, I said, please find Omar a room in the city so he doesn't have to do that journey. And they did. And he was a joy. So we were really worried when we heard about the earthquake. So our daughter messaged Omar. Because those of you who know me know I don't do technology <laughs> other than a toaster and a kettle. <laughs> <laughs> anyway. And a message came back to say that he and his family had survived yeah. and were well. Better than that, just before we left yesterday, we got a phone call from Omar and a photograph of him giving out food from the Storyteller's Cafe to the survivors in the Atlas Mountains. 
but surrounded by the ruins, giving out the food. He had a carpet on the floor and a group of children around him, and in national costume, he was telling them a story. And he said, Mr. Tapper, he said, <laughs> since meeting you, my storytelling journey has started. Oh. Oh. And one of the wonderful things that so much, so look out for him if he's coming over here. As I spent time with him, John spent time with him, and so did several others who were here who came over. So he's happy and on the way. But that festival asked to borrow uh, my title of ancestral voices, and I was happy to give back to the festival because it's about passing it on. But the month before we got there, one of their old story masters, who was a man, hang on now, before I tell you about him and tell you one of his stories, I mentioned the garden. Have we got any gardeners here? We know I like to give stories away, so I'm just going to give you this one. Because my venue in the Lake District where I choose to tell stories is the Storyteller's Garden in Grasmere. Opposite the gingerbread shop. Two good reasons for that. <laughs> so there we are. So when I moved to Grasmere, the best gardener in Grasmere was a man called John Nelson. And I really admire his garden, no longer with us. One day, this is a this little story is a gift for all the gardeners here. John Nelson was in his garden and it was spring. And he was just tidying the garden, and our rector, our vicar, came by. He said, morning, John. And John said, morning, Rector. Garden's looking good, John. Thanks, Rector. And then the vicar said, isn't it remarkable the works of God and man together? And John said, yes, Rector. You should have seen the mess it was in when he had it on his own. <laughs> <laughs> So, anyway, I'll come back to the garden after telling you about this story master, as they call them. The old storytellers, they don't call them mentors, if they're passing the skills on, they're called masters. And they called John and I masters when we were there, which we've both been humble to have found it. Well, it was No, it was just ordinary storyteller. Anyway. We were, we were story masters. One of the masters who died a month before we got there was a man called Muley Mohammed El Jabri. So I, how was I going to hear his stories? This is where the BBC came in. There's a lot of criticism of the BBC these days, but the North Africa correspondent of the BBC is a man called Richard Hamilton. And he used his first year as a North Africa correspondent, to photograph all of the old masters, because he knew they were dying, and record their stories. I managed to have an archive photo. It's in the car, and wants to see it, of Mule Mohammed El Jabri. He gave me one of his stories. And that's the story I'm going to tell you, because it, it's fun, and it's entertaining, and even though it's very Moroccan, it never fails with folks. I hope it never fails <laughs> folks here in the UK. So this from Mule, even though it's from beyond the grave. Not far from Marrakesh there was a farmer who lived with his 12 year old son Mura. In their garden they had a fig tree. But that fig tree never bore fruit until one spring the farmer went out into the garden and on the lower branches of the fig tree there were three fat juicy figs, each the size of my fist. So he called Murad his son down and the boy ran excitedly out to the garden. He said, look at these figs. And the boy looked at those figs. He said, shall we pick them, Dad? He said, yes, we'll pick them in a moment. But call folks in from the village. So folks came in from the village and they marveled at these three enormous juicy figs that were there on the lower branches of the tree. 
We said we will pick them, but just to the south of here, in the next town down, there's an 80 year old sultan. And he's a very kind and generous man. He's very kind to all of his people, he looks after them. I think we should take these three things as a gift to him. So the farmer got a basket and he lined the basket with leaves and a fig tree. And Murad picked the three figs and put them in the basket. And now, son, the farmer said, your job is to take these three figs and give them as a gift to the kind old salt. Well in his 80s, but a kind and compassionate man. He's worthy for the gift of our first ever three figs. Even though the boy was Moroccan and knew well the customs of the land, <coughs> But his walk to the city, to the Sultan's palace, he didn't take with him a gourd of water for the journey. He just picked up the basket <coughs> and started walking. But the sun, bright Phoebus, was golden and blazing down. Before long, sweat appeared on the 12 year old boy's forehead and on the back of his neck and was trickling down between his shoulder blades. But worse than that, he had a fierce thirst. And he thought, if I don't drink something soon, I'm going to die in this heat. He hadn't taken any water with him for the journey. And he thought, that's all right, because round the next bend, there was a dip in the road with a stream. I can drink some water from that stream. It's clean water. So he carried on round the bend, clutching the basket. When he got to that stream, the sun had blazed down so hot the stream had dried up. On the banks of the stream, there was a dead goat, a goat that had died of thirst, just the skeleton of a goat. And the boy thought, if I don't drink something, that could be me. And he looked in the basket and he saw these three fat figs. And he thought, now those figs are full of juice. But those figs are for the salter. But there are three of them. They're so big that surely two of them will be enough for the salter. And he just picked one out, and he popped it in his mouth, and he closed his mouth on it, and the fig burst, and the sweet juice trickled down his throat, and he felt a little bit better. And grabbing the basket with the two figs in, he continued his journey. But the sun got even hotter. And before long, his thirst, his fierce thirst returned. He thought, that's all right. Around the next bend, there's an oasis. I can drink there. So he continued around the next bend. And you know, the sun was so hot that the pond in that oasis had dried up. The palm tree was there, but on the banks, where the pond had been, there was a skeleton of a man who died of thirst. He thought, that will surely be me if I don't drink. Now there are two figs in this basket, and they're so big that surely one of them will be enough for the salt. So he just took another fig out of the basket, he closed his mouth on it, the fig burst, and the sweet juice trickled down his throat. And he felt a little bit better, but ahead of him, he could see the walls of the city he was going towards, the minarets, uh, the domes, and the arched entrance through the city walls. And he thought, I'm nearly there. But I was taking three figs, and I've eaten two of them. There's one really fat fig here. Hopefully that will be enough the Sultan to enjoy in my farm. And he walked to the arched entrance to the city walls, and the guard said, What do you want? And the boy said, I brought a present to the Sultan. Follow me, the guard said. And he took him to the Sultan's palace. But the boy realized now, having eaten two of the figs, he was in trouble. So as soon as he met the Sultan, he threw himself down on the ground, put his face to the floor in front of the Sultan. And the Sultan, who was a kind man, said, whatever's the matter with you? 
And he said, well, my father, the first time his tree bought three fat, juicy figs. And he asked me to bring them to you as a present in gratitude for your compassion and your kindness. And I've eaten two of them on the journey because I didn't take the water with me. And the Sultan ran his fingers through the boy's hair and he realized that the boy didn't have a bad bone in his body. He was perhaps just a little bit simple. He said, just a minute, three figs. And you eat two of them. Were those figs that you had the same size as this one? So pointing at this enormous thing left in the basket. And the boy said, yes, they were. And the Sultan said, well, however did you manage to eat two figs that were that big? And the boy said, it was easy. I did it like this. <laughs> <laughs> and he the third thing, popped in his mouth, closed his mouth, and used triple down his neck. And he feared for his life. The Sultan merely asked his servants to fill the basket that the boy had brought with gold and silver. And he said, now you must take this basket back to your father and thank him for the generous gift of the three figs that he sent me, even though none of those three figs passed my lips. <laughs> but you don't have to tell your father that bit. And with that, he gave the young boy a hug and he also gave him a good of water <laughs> to journey home. And young Laura took the basket and the good water up and he continued on his journey home and gave a basket of gold and silver to his father with the Sultan's thanks, his gratitude for the gift that he'd been, that he'd been sent to him. So you see, embracing the spirit of compassion that <clears throat> that 80 year old Sultan had, I think this is a time that we could all do something to help our storytelling friends and the people of Marrakesh and Morocco. Now I mentioned my storyteller's garden. Now it just happened that that was so popular in the Northwest that the largest garden center in Cheshire, and I don't, is there anybody here from Cheshire? Which is a garden center called Burley Dam, invited Chris and I to produce a storyteller's garden in their garden center. And this is an idea for any of you tell stories in gardens, whether it's a school garden, your own garden, or a public garden. Every month I had to have a story about a plant of some kind, which we then recorded. And the head gardener at the end of the recording gave his instructions, his tips on how to grow that plant. And those were on a CD and they were sold and also, once a month, I went and told the story live. But after that, people could hear the recording by pressing a button on top of the bird box. In the car. <laughs> and so popular that it won an industry Blue Sky Award for initiative, which was not money, but a certificate, which covered a patch in the wall. <laughs> <laughs> but they gave us a certain number of these CDs at the end of the project and said use them for something worthwhile. So I brought some of them here. This particular one is the snapdragon plant. There's another one here which is the uh, the girl, the ogre and the apple tree. The instructions to grow the apple tree and the snapdragon. And John has a pile of these CDs here for the popular price five pounds each and every penny is going to the earthquake fund and so if you all like one of those by reach then by all means use the story and plant the plant in your garden <laughs> two last things when i was working on uh, a new show for this year's fate with Chrissy. We had Radio Forum, as we often do. 
And there was a program about the Ice Steadfords. And as you might guess from my name, I have Welsh blood in my vein, although I've never lived there. But a Welsh poet finished one of his poems, and Tamar and Michael are not here to help me with it in Welsh. But I can tell you the translation. He ended the poem, and I so love this, I've taken it on board with the line translated into English is they gave you gold they gave me a storm mm. which is just perfect <clears throat> so have fun tell the stories and look after the stories the only way you can harm a traditional folk tale is by not telling it yeah. <laughs> look after the stories keep them entertaining because they're worth their weight Thank you, Tuffis. I'm not going to battle my way to the front to say thank you. Um, I, I don't think I need to add anything to that at all. Just to, to say just how much we love having you here as our patron and to have that as following our AGM, I think if that doesn't take us on to do something special, I don't know what you're going to do. Mm -hmm. um, so please, one more round of applause for Taffy. Yeah. And a special thank you to Barbara. Oh, yeah. yes.